God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then verse 17, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And there's another scripture that talks about how we are already condemned if we believe not in Jesus Christ. And obviously there's also scriptures that talk about that there's many different versions and types of Jesus that people want to believe in. And uh, there's only one Jesus though. And uh, the Jesus that I know, he is not only savior of the world, but he's also God and he's creator, as well as he is the final judge. What Satan's doing is he's calling true Christians out because he knows those that follow the true Lord are going to stand up and call this out. It must be called out. And therefore, we're going to face political persecution as well as spiritual persecution and therefore dividing the nation even more than it's divided. But the true calling of a man of God is to call out evil and bring men to repentance. I really think the enemy is starting. He, he's pushing the frontline wars here in America now in the church. And while most of our audience is probably Christian, there will probably be some people out there who have no idea about who Jesus is and what we're talking about when we say repent or repentance. You want to elaborate on that? Yeah, when I say that bring men to repentance, it's to turn from the errors of their ways of sin and to call upon God and to follow Him. Not follow the world, not follow a pastor, but what saith the Lord. To really forsake the flesh and to become a true true child of God. A lot of people say re repentance means the changing of the mind, and it does, but that changing of the mind will also uh, create a, a newness of life to follow after the true living. Yeah, and even if we go back to the first, the very first chapter of the book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, in verse 27 it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So what what I gather from this scripture, which I do believe that these are the inspired words of God that came through, as best we can tell, Moses as it concerns the book of Genesis, there's a few things to learn from here. One is that God is the creator of mankind. He made us in his own image. And he made us either male or female. Another point that I think is important to bring to light is the fact that many people who claim to be transgender are not actually transgender. They have actually not accomplished what they truly set out to do, which is to change their gender. They may think that they have because they have maybe altered their breasts, altered genitalia, they put some makeup on or they take it off, they take some steroids, some type of hormones, and they might alter some of their facial features, maybe grow a beard or cease being able to grow facial hair. But at the end of the day, the only thing that really dictates what your gender is that will truly have to be changed and can't be changed is the DNA. Am I wrong? No, you're absolutely correct. Doesn't matter what they do on the outside, they are still a male or a female on the inside, just as God created them. And that's another thing I think that is going on with this transgender is in direct opposition to God. Even though a person that does it sometimes may not be like, well, I'm going to defy God, because a lot of them, you know, they are confused and they think, you know, what they believe, but it still comes from, ultimately comes from the spiritual deception of Satan trying to defy God right to his face. And it's not, um, they, they've not, like you said, they've not completed what they've set out to do at all. Yeah, in fact, if you don't mind, I'd like to read Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32, because this really, I believe, puts it into perspective about how men and women, unfortunately, um, both have completely fallen for making themselves their own idol, their own God. And that's kind of important for someone who uh, is in the transgender movement to first identify that the God of the Bible, or really any God, probably isn't maybe the right God or even maybe the most important God, thereby making themselves to be their own creator, their own creator of their destiny, their own creation, basically. 
And who else do we find attempting to be, you know, a different gender or maybe even both genders? It's only Satan and through the Baphomet. That's right, through the Baphomet. Most people probably don't even recognize that, do they? Nah, they don't. I don't think they draw that connection at all. Yeah, that that was pretty wild to me. In fact, um, a lot of this gender confusion, really the Baphomet comes from a false doctrine from Kabbalah, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, the Kabbalah is actually the source of almost all of this that we're under, like the science, the false science of the Big Bang. It was brought through the Kabbalah. The Baphomet is brought through Kabbalah. A lot of the occultic stuff that we have today has still been passed down from thousands of years of Kabbalah. So if the, the if the listeners really don't know what we're talking about, I would suggest them to go really do a research on Kabbalah Exposed. I'm going to go ahead and read Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through 32, just to help put this into perspective that this is really nothing literally new under the sun. This is something that even the Apostle Paul even spoke to to a a certain extent where people glorified God not as God, but instead they worshiped the creation and they worshiped themselves. So here we go, starting with verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Meaning they are actually accountable. They know who they are and they're denying us. Verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. This is a very interesting verse. If anyone has ever wondered how it is possible that they're living on a spinning ball, flying through space, I would challenge you to reread Genesis chapter 1 and try to figure out how a firmament fits over a ball that's spinning. And uh, if you want more information, just go to flatearthdoctrine.com, go to the scriptures page, and you might be quite surprised if we're not living on a spinning ball. But what's most interesting about that is that the creation is singularly the only thing that leaves every man without excuse to their very creator. That's why the creation, I believe, is completely under attack and has been for an extremely long time. And that's why we have this big bang godless universe that atheist scientists are glorifying. So anyways, I'll go on with 21. So because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Verse 23, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Verse 24, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the love lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 26, for this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. 27, and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. Verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, verse 30, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Verse 31, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. What do you think about that? That's uh, very plain and very offensive. 
you ask me. That's what they would say today. But it says right there in verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. That stuck out to me so much as you were reading, because now when you talk about God, they say they don't believe in God. But when you talk about God, they get very, very vile. And why? Like when someone talks about Santa Claus, I don't get very vile. You know, when someone talks about the Easter Bunny, I don't get very vile, even though I know those things don't because I know those things don't exist. But when we bring up God, they hate it and they get very vile. I think it's very important for us to maybe talk about like how should we as Christians deal with such situations as now we have transgender pastors? I can't even I can't even believe I'm, I'm we're talking about this, but I believe the war that we're getting to, to ready to face is going to be a war within the church, not even necessarily with unbelievers, but people who believe they are are called of God. Ultimately, it has to come from a place of love. Like this transgender pastor may believe that he I will say he because it is a he she go. He goes by a she pronoun, but ultimately it's a he. He may believe that he is doing God's work, but we know that we are to call out false doctrines. We know that we are to bring men, like you said earlier, to repentance. And I think that there is a dire need for young Christians to be exposed to the truth of the doctrine and to help them understand that love is not always seemingly very kind up front because even us as God's children, it says, whom God uh, loves, he disciplines, but no discipline seems, you know, very fun or very nice at the time, but in its time, it will produce a righteous fruit. So this must be addressed within the church and leaders, those on the tip of the spear must go in and, and combat this because this is going to lead many young Christians astray and confuse many, many young Christians because they believe that Jesus is all lovey, dovey, sugar-coated message. And it's not. Jesus would be flipping tables over in this situation. I don't think that Jesus even encountered himself such blasphemous evil inside of um, his house. He said, you have made my father's house a den of thieves, and it's supposed to be a house of prayer. To me, this is, this is, is blasphemous. It's, it's evil to its core, and it must be dealt with. Jesus Christ, he is God. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for you and me while we were still sinners in hopes that we would repent of our sin and turn to him for he is the only one who conquered the grave and lives forevermore. And so for anyone out there who is upset with God for allowing or permitting people to go to hell for their sin, why don't you think about it a little bit differently? This is a righteous judge. Would you you ever wish that if you went to a court and your family member was brutally murdered that the judge when looking at the person who you know for sure sure did it that he just let that person walk although all the evidence pointed there was no question no doubt that person was guilty would you be okay with that probably not god is absolutely more so righteous in his judgment and he's not going to give any one of us a pass except for those who bear the name of Jesus Christ. And I think all of us should truly be thankful to even have one way to get to heaven and to be redeemed by God. And many people are quite upset that God would only give one way to be redeemed, and that through Jesus Christ. Instead of being angry that there's only one way, at least there is one way. God didn't even have to make one way for us, but he chose to because he loves us. So every person, instead of thinking that, you know, God's just going to condemn everyone to hell, think of it this way. We're already condemned. We have at least been given an opportunity to repent and believe on Jesus and be truly saved through the blood, shed blood of Jesus Christ. So I would just challenge anyone who's upset with the fact that there's only one way to reconsider and instead be thankful that there's at least one way. Know his word, get in his word, and what the word says is what it is. More people that claim to be Christians today in America, they're more about their emotions rather than what the word says. 
I've talked to many Christians who have come at me over the things that I've taught of what the Word says, and then I'll say, well, listen, this is what God's Word says, and I will have some of them say, I don't care. This isn't right. This is offensive. And Jesus said, woe unto those who are offended at my Word. You know, let them be offended. Tell the truth, but tell it in love. Don't tell it from a fighting or a angry standpoint, but tell them the truth in love, and then the truth it can set them free. Amen. The times are getting very dark. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. That's Isaiah 55, 6. Wow. The reason why this podcast is called The Last Call.